take a break in the in the routine. All right, very good. Let's pray. Lord God, you're a good and gracious Father. As we open up now our time for your word, we ask you to touch our hearts. Um, each one here is here for a different reason. Uh, they're, they're, they have different things going on in their lives. So Father, we ask for a focus. We ask for a, uh, uh, distractions to be, to be taken away or at least filtered through what we're going to learn right now. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, we have been waltzing through this passage of, uh, of Scripture, 1 Peter, for 24, uh, 24 weeks. Uh, we have learned so much about this passage. You know, we, we've, some of the things that we've, we've learned is the, the main theme is that when we're going through our struggles and our trials, God uses them to strengthen us. God uses our trials to uh, strengthen our faith strengthen our resolve, you know, but it's only when we are obedient that God takes those trials that you're going through and uses them to strengthen you. You know, I was reading, uh, I love uh, reading through the book of Acts. Acts is such a dynamic, powerful book. It's just filled with stories of the Holy Spirit uh, empowering the church. And oh my goodness, there's so many amazing things that happen in the book of Acts. Like in Acts 5, when Peter and the apostles began to first preach the good news of Jesus Christ, and they immediately started getting opposition from the Jewish ruling council. So much opposition, so that it was so much so that they put them in jail. Now, and back then, the jails were not the, these cushy places that you might be thinking of, you know, with the cushioned beds and the watching TV and everything. I mean, these jails were, were horrible places, and not only did they put them in the jail, but they beat them before they put them in jail. And they strictly told them to stop teaching about Jesus. Had it not been for one of their own leadership, these, these, uh, the, the ruling council would have killed them. So there were, they went into jail, beaten and hurting. Their lives were threatened. And do you know what it says their response to that was? In Acts chapter 5, it says, listen, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer the dishonor, to suffer dishonor for the name. And that's not the only story like that. Later on in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel of God and Jesus Christ, and then they saved this young slave girl from possession of a demon, and men who were making money off of her because the demons were uh, uh, were abusing her, um, I'm sorry, these men were using her because the, de the demons told uh, the future for people and they made money off of her by doing that. Well, they healed this little girl and this, uh, this made these men mad. So they went out and they told everybody that these men over here are disturbing the city. They're causing a riot. And so what they did is they attacked them. Can you imagine a crowd of people attacking two guys? The people who ruled these, this, this crowd, the, the magistrates, the people in the city, who I mean, the ones who ruled the city, tore off their clothes and they beat them severely. So they were sitting there possibly without any clothes on at all, being beaten with rods, and they were thrown into prison. And do you know what their reaction was? Paul and Silas' reaction was in Acts 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Man, I wish I were like that. I wish that I could, when I am suffering at the hands of somebody because I've been sharing the gospel of God, I wish that I could walk away from that not feeling, what, 
humiliated, embarrassed. I don't want to say anything. No, I mean, if, if this would have happened to me, I can, I'll be honest, I don't know what I would be saying, but they would not be hearing, oh, praise God, I'm, I love the fact that I went through that. What would you be saying? Oh, woe is me, right? My word, I get a sore in my back and I'm like, oh, Lord, this is, I, I want to end my life. That's my level. I love the stories of how God works in the hearts of people and it makes them and it enables them to do things that they would never be able to do without him. Today we're finalizing, we're finishing up a book that we have been studying about suffering and the right responses to suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, just read along quietly as I read. It says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. In it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, we're only going to handle one part of this passage of scripture it's not the one about greeting one another with a kiss of love you okay with that James yeah you're very happy we're not going to talk about that but what I want to focus on is the passage which says I am exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God stand firm in it you know over our last 24 sermons we've discovered that first Peter is about a book of suffering right? The idea of suffering is talked about 17 times in this little short book. In five chapters, suffering is mentioned 17 times. The sufferings of Christ uh, are mentioned six times, and our suffering is mentioned 11 times. We're, it's all about suffering. You know what? It's all also all about glory. You know, the idea of glory is talked about 11 times. The glory of Christ is talked about five, and our glory is talked about six times. You see, we will share in, in the suffering of Christ, and we will share in the glory of Christ. It's like suffering and glory are things which are apportioned to us as believers in Jesus Christ. We are called to suffer, and we are called to be glorified. We are to share in Christ's suffering and his glory. That really makes this passage in 1 Peter kind of like the theme passage. In, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You see, we are, as believers, supposed to suffer, but then we are also supposed to glory, be glory, be glorified. But when putting the final touches on this letter, Peter doesn't reiterate that this book is about suffering or about glory. Peter emphasizes a different thought. Peter says that this brief letter is an exhortation and a declaration that this letter is the, what's it say? The true grace of God. This is a short letter. This whole book has been a short letter about God's grace. The emphasis on suffering is there. The emphasis on being glorified is there. But the emphasis that Peter wants us to see now is that this is, is God's true grace. Peter tells us to stand firm in this true grace. You know what stand firm means? It's very different than how I walked down those stairs as I was going into the... That was not firm. That was quickly get yourself composed before you reveal yourself to the crowd. 
Someone who is standing firm has, has taken hold of one's ground. They've maintained their position. It's to be steadfast or upright upon a solid foundation. A slippery step is not a solid foundation. But Paul or Peter says, stand firm in this foundation of true grace. So if we're going to stand firm in true grace to make this our strong foundation, something that we can bank on, something that we can place our trust in when we're really struggling, then we better understand what Peter means by the true grace of God. And that's what we're going to do today. So in order to understand this, we're going to tackle the idea of grace. We're going to get the definition of grace. We're going to see examples of grace, and then we're going to see the means of grace. I loved this study because grace is a word that is used all the time in the English vernacular, and I don't think we really know what it means when it comes to God's grace. So let's start with the definition. Now, the word grace is used a lot in the English vernacular. You like that word? Vernacular. Does it prove that I'm smart? No. All right, so <laughs> it shows I have a good thesaurus. The word grace is used. Now, we're going to play a quick game. It's one of my favorite games that I like to play at the house. It's my favorite game. I can't think of the name of it, but the, what happens is I'm going to give you a short phrase about this, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's a short phrase in the English language which uses the word grace, right? I'm going to give you a short clue, and then you tell me what the word or, or, or the two or three uh, word phrase is, all right? So we're going to start. Now, don't, don't show it, Eric, okay? You got, it's black. All right, the next one is going to, you're going to see one of them, right? So don't, don't, show, don't show it. All right, here we go, here we go. So the phrase has something with grace in it. See if you can figure it out. This is one of the most recognizable hymns. Amazing Grace. Let's see what that is. And the survey says, ding, 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 good job. All right. I think that was 100%. Every single person said that. All right, next one. When we want to pray over our food, we say grace. Let's see what that is, ladies and gentlemen. Say grace. Very good. Okay, so they're easy, aren't they? When one loses respect, they have what? Fallen from, I thought that would be a hard one. Let's see if that's it. Of course that's it. All right. A period of time allowed for a fulfillment of an obligation. Good. That one got a little less people. Great. I'm sorry. Is that it? Grace period. Very good. All right. Here's a little, this one's more difficult. Let's see if you can get this. A title or form of address for a duke, duchess, or archbishop. Oh, what? Okay, very good. I thought that was a good one. All right. So we use it a lot. We use this idea of grace, but do we truly understand what it means? The dictionary definition of grace has so many options. Each one of these are correct. Right? But each one is not what we're looking for. There's even this idea of a graceful movement of a ballet dancer or the gracious manner of behaving well. We can grace people with our presence, right? But the definition that applies here is the one that we get from our Bible dictionary, and that is grace is the resulting activity that is a necessary consequence of genuine, beneficent goodwill especially used for the outworking of God's goodwill. In other words, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Pretty simple. Grace is unmerited favor of God. God gives us favor, though we don't deserve it. If you have a, a kid's page, that line is on there. The blank that starts with an F is favor, F. A V O R. God's grace is closely associated with mercy and forgiveness. It's something that God does that comes from who He is. God is a gracious God. 
He is a genuine God with a heart for us. He loves us and he responds to us in grace. So the definition of the definition simply is the unmerited favor of God. So what are some examples that we see? Well, we see examples of grace in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Um, in the Old Testament, God looked with favor on one guy first in the Bible. Can anybody guess who that guy is? The first time that the idea of favor was shown on somebody. Who, would, who might that be? Yeah, that's right. His, it was Noah. God showed grace to Noah, first demonstrating it by saving him and his family. Now, later on in the Bible, throughout all of the Old Testament, God gave grace and showed grace to Abraham. He showed grace to Jacob. He showed grace to Joseph and Moses and Samuel and David. So many people in the Bible, God showed grace just by placing them in his plan of redemption. In some, some of the kings, God showed grace. And God demonstrated his grace by choosing the people of Israel. See, God didn't have to do any of that. But God chose, out of his goodwill, to use these people in his redemption. And all of these people came together and God used them to point us to Jesus Christ. And that's in the New Testament where God shows us his grace through Jesus Christ. Jesus became God's grace to the world, God's goodwill, God's uh, 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 unmerited favor to us. Our salvation through Jesus Christ is by God's grace. Our belief in him is an outworking of God's grace. His word God's word is given to us by God's grace. We are justified by God's grace. Every promise God gives to us is fulfilled through Jesus Christ by God's grace. Every child that stood up there today to be baptized is saved by their own merit? No, they are saved by God's grace. And so when you think about that, you think of, I didn't earn my salvation. What is the response? Well, first, you're shaking your head if you're thinking, how could I ever imagine that I came to salvation on my own? I needed God's grace, and so I am thankful. We have access to God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ by which we stand. So we have our definition of God's grace, unmerited favor. We've seen examples of God's grace all throughout the Old Testament and into the New. And now I want to talk about, in a remainder of our time, we're going to talk about the means of God's grace. How do we get God's grace? And today we're going to look at three different ways. There's lots of them out there. Some say there's like seven different ways of, of attaining God's grace. But we're going to look at three of them. And each one of these is going to help us understand God's grace better. First of all, we gain access to God's grace by being in God's covenant. Covenant. That's, a, that's kind of a, a big religious word, isn't it? Covenant. You don't often use that word in your own discussion with your, with your friend. Let's covenant together. That doesn't happen. So we look at, well, what does covenant mean? You know, covenant is just simply an agreement between two parties. The covenant that happened between God and man is one of the most important truths in the Bible. The perfect, now think about this. <laughs> the perfect, all-knowing, sinless, holy God made a covenant with sinful, weak, finite mankind. That's significant. God made a promise to a sinful mankind and has held to it and promises to hold to it. In the Old Testament, God promised that he would provide salvation 
in spite of the people's inability to keep their side of the agreement. You know, man was supposed to obey the law, right? Remember, Keith, reading in the Old Testament, how, how many laws could somebody break before they would become a sinner? One, that's right. Did anybody obey all of God's laws? The answer is no. So God, in his goodwill, in his grace, promised these people who are unable to keep their side of the agreement that he would save them, he, that he would do it through a Messiah. The covenants that God made with various people in the Old Testament all pointed to the final New Testament covenant that he revealed through Jesus Christ. In each covenant, you can see the demonstration of God's grace. In the God's covenant with Adam, God would, by his grace, raise up a Messiah to defeat evil. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. And as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God was being gracious. God, in God's covenant with Noah, he promised that he would never flood the world again so that this Messiah could, be, could, could happen, so this salvation could occur. Do you remember what the sign that God gave to mankind that he would never flood the world again? again? That's right, it was a rainbow. <laughs> That's God's sign to us that he will never destroy the world again. Every time I see a rainbow, I think of God's promise that he will never destroy the world by a flood again. I love that. That's God's promise. That's God's covenant. God's promise with Abraham, God's covenant with him said he would promise to bless and protect Ab Abraham's descendants so that the Messiah would be born through them. In God's covenant with David, he told him that he, the Messiah would come from his descendants. You see, every single covenant is a demonstration of God's goodwill or God's grace. And so all of these covenants, all of these promises are actually one great big covenant of grace. And so the only way we are given grace is by being within these covenants. So how do we enter into a covenant relationship with God? How do we put ourselves underneath this covenant of grace? Well, you heard three of them this morning. Through faith in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. You see, Jesus Christ's life and his death and his resurrection ushered in this covenant of grace that all of the Old Testament covenants were pointing to. We are justified by grace and mercy, not by our attempts to keep the law. And so when you think about this idea of the covenant of grace, you realize that Jesus Christ is like the embodiment of grace, isn't he? When you think of Jesus Christ, you think of God's grace. By grace, God gave Jesus Christ the Son who accomplished the requirements of the law. That Remember what I was talking with Keith about? The perfect, perfect obedience, right, Keith? Jesus Christ accomplished perfect obedience and restored this relationship between man and God, and then he was killed for your and my sin. And I love Jesus Christ. I love him so much. And I think any believer who truly understands this under, understands how much they love Jesus Christ because Jesus is determined to keep us qualified for eternal life in spite of our unworthiness, in spite of our failings. Jesus Christ is determined to keep us qualified. And he does this through our trials. And now here's 1 Peter. We're talking about suffering in 1 Peter. We're talking about the good, the right responses to suffering in 1 Peter. That, that suffering is actually something good for us. This is where grace and suffering 
come together. First Peter marries them so beautifully. This is why Peter calls this letter, which is so much about suffering, God's true grace. You get that? We can see God's grace working in every single chapter in First Peter. I'm going to run through each chapter. There's only five of them. But in each chapter, you see God's grace. Just, just it's bathed in it. It's almost, like, it's almost like it's baptized in God's grace. Baptized. You get that, Donna? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that really? Thanks. Okay, so God is baptized the book of 1 Peter in grace. I'm going to write that down. 1 <laughs> Peter. Chapter 1, God's power guards us through our faith for salvation. In God's, by God's grace, our faith is tested by our trials and remains secure. By God's grace, our trials, by our trials, we will be holy as he is holy through our faith and hope in the blood of Jesus Christ. All of these things by God's grace. Grace. 1 Peter chapter 2, by God's grace, we have indeed tasted of the Lord and found him good. By God's grace, we have been made, oh, yeah, I don't want to miss this, right? It's by God's grace that we are a what? Chosen race. Now, anybody who's a visitor here, just know we've been doing this for like, you know, 10 weeks. So if you don't know it, that's okay. So God has, has put us into, we are a chosen race, right? We are a royal priesthood this is like the 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 tippy top hat of a priest right royal priesthood we are a holy nation good who nation who whose king is there is god we are god's possession right protected by him by god's grace we are all of those things we, by God's grace, we can abstain from the passions of the flesh that war within our souls. By God's grace, we can keep our conduct honorable when we are slandered. By God's grace, we can submit to the authorities in spite of our suffering, unless, of course, they try to usurp God's authority. That's only chapter 2. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. That's eight different areas that God is working by his grace. Chapter 3 says, by God's grace, we can sacrifice and make our wives or our husbands a top priority in our lives. No, uh, by God's grace, we can sacrifice and be united and sympathetic with all believers. By God's grace, we do not fear our oppressors, but remain obedient to the Lord. By God's grace, we can suffer for doing good if it be God's will and as, uh, as Christ did and be baptized with a clear conscience. That's chapter 3. And chapter 4 says, by God's grace, we can resist peer pressure of those who truly cannot understand our change. By God's grace, we can be self Controlled, sober minded, prayerful, loving, hospitable, serving, and speaking as God would have us speak. By God's grace, we can rejoice that the Spirit of glory rests on us when we share in Christ's suffering. And by God's grace, we can entrust our souls to a faithful Creator while we do good. Hoy, that's chapter four. And then chapter five by God's grace, we have elders to lead us willingly as shepherds who lead his flock by god's grace we can humble ourselves under his mighty hand and be lifted up and by god's grace he will restore confirm strengthen and establish us so is this book about god's grace it's by these three or by these personal trials the things that we suffer, the struggles that we go through, that we experience God's true grace. It's in God's true grace that we stand. And we are not moved. Remember the definition of standing firm? It means to hold one's ground, to maintain a position, to be steadfast upon a foundation. So as we're leaving our study of 1 Peter, how do we know when we are truly standing in God's true grace? There's a passage of scripture where Jesus tells us to stand on a foundation made of a rock and not of 
stand. We have a video which talks about that. There were two men. Each set out to build their home. One built his upon the rocks, while the other did so upon the sand. And then came the storm. There are absolutes. Things that are fixed that no matter how much we may want to move them, will always remain. Jesus said anyone who hears his words and does them will have his life built upon the rock. But to not do them is to live upon the sand. Rock or sand? You see, the ocean is immense, completely vast, pulled by forces beyond man's control, and therefore, it demands respect. You see, it doesn't know you, and it doesn't care about you. It can't. The ocean is an unyielding force. You've been to it. And much like the tides of the ocean, each wave of our culture is a voice washing over the known ideas and fixed points of the world around us. This energy, this force, presses on as each new generation takes the place of the last. And the sands that we've come to identify with shift. The waves move the sand. Culture changes, but we're told that there is no God and you are an accident. There's no right or wrong way. You make your own truth. On these sands, even established scientific facts like gender are shifting. From here, fame and popularity become more important than kindness and virtue. The lines of good and evil are blurred. Compliance to these ideas is demanded, and the rock? The rock is hated. You see, culture will mold you, and society will shape you. It will forcibly bend you to its will as long as you remain on the shore. And today, we haven't just built homes on the sand. No, we've built kingdoms and countries upon it. More and more have left the rock to enjoy the temporary pleasures of the shore, unaware that nothing will withstand the tide. Make no mistake, the tide is rising. These sands will move. Don't let yourself be drawn out to sea, but rather find the rock. Without a foundation, without a guide, and without rules, we know a society breaks down. See, we've been taught to look at the teachings of Jesus as something to block us from pleasure and enjoyment, when in reality, it was put there to build our life upon, to protect us. The world always calls to us, but it never wants us to leave. And yes, I fully engage society, but my home is on the rock. The water is already rising. We're living in a world gone mad, and no one has the answers. When the floods come, something always has to give. Either the waves will break you, or the rock will break the waves. There's only one who can save us. He's the one who walked on water through the storm to save those who believed in him. When Peter began to sink under the waves, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus, with compassion in his eyes, pulls Peter from the water. He holds his hand to you. There's no condemnation. He's not mad. He just wants to save you, to pull you to the rock. God, the foundation of God, God. There's way too many people out there, too many churches that are looking elsewhere for truth and for guidance. We don't want to be a church like that, people. people. Members of Faith Baptist Church have committed themselves to loving God's worth, word and living by that word. We're not perfect, are we? We're not perfect. We make mistakes, and we know that. But that what it, that's what it means to live on this foundation. Because when we do wrong, we change. We shift back to the rock. See, this is the true grace, ladies and gentlemen. This is God's truth, God's promises, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, with whom we are sharing in the suffering and in his glory what would my life, this is what I want us to ask ourselves, what would my life look like if I committed myself every day to seeking the grace of God in my trials?
seeing the grace of God in my trials and moving away from seeing them as just something I want to stop. Because guess what? Some of our trials will never end. As I get older, there are trials that I go through that will be with me the rest of my life. That's a hard truth, but it is a real one. What if I stopped trying to stop them? What if I stopped trying to move away from them, stop complaining about them, and instead let these trials do their work in my life? What does a trial do in our lives? It makes us more reliant on God. It makes our faith more stable. And it makes us more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what trials can do. And think about this. Satan could deluge you with trials. Satan could baptize you in suffering. But God is using that to make you stronger. Is that a great truth or what? This is just the beginning of how to understand how to rejoice in our trials. So let's continue together, encouraging one another. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Father, for what you're learning, or what you're, I'm sorry, what you're teaching us and what we're learning from your word. You are so precious to us, Father. We thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you so much for these young folks, how they are an example to us of a simple, childlike faith. I read it, I hear about it, I'm taught, and, and I just believe. I ask you, Father, that we, that you'll help us, that you'll guide us, that you'll place our feet firmly on the foundation of your truth. 